Hey everybody, let me put that down. I wanted to make a video because in the last video that I put up, which was about demons and timelines and stuff, somebody asked about twin flames. And another person in the video right before that, I can't remember which video that was, also asked about twin flames. And the first person who asked about twin flames, it was pretty obvious that they were getting frustrated. <laughs> they were getting a little jaded about this new age buzzword, buzz term, twin flame, and whether it was actually a real thing. And I said to the first person that I did have some videos on this, I think a couple of videos on Twin Flames, what they are and what it means and how to find them, but I recommended that they not go back and check out those videos and because I think I've changed my mind about it. And, and let me just say first, I think it's okay to change your mind. I think it's okay in terms of knowledge and understanding and energy to be exactly where you are when you're there. And five years ago, I was exactly where I was when I was there. And I believed things based on what I knew to be true. And I practiced things based on how I knew how to do those things. But five years later, I'm a different person. You know, every seven years, your body completely transforms itself. All the cells are new. Everything changes. And that it stands to reason, doesn't it, that the consciousness is also somewhat reflected in this. Like, we, we shift. We change as we raise our vibration, as we take on new energy, new information, new content, new knowledge, of course, that's gonna shift how we think. Where we get stuck so often, I do believe, is in this space where we refuse to give up formerly held beliefs. We refuse to give up formerly sacred dogma or theology or ideas of how things work. As I've said before, and, and as I'm sure I'll say for the rest of my life, the more enlightened you become, the more you truly know, the more you realize you don't know a lot at all. In fact, that which seems so very true, that which we know in our spirit, in our essence, is almost inarticulatable. That's not a word. It could be unarticulate. You can't articulate it. It's hard to speak on it because it's something that when you get to the core of it is wholly felt to be true. And so as you enlighten, as you learn, as you read your books, as you get mentoring, as you get teachers and classes, you get closer to that which can't, cannot even be op opined upon or spoken of. So years ago, you know, in my travels as a spiritual journeyer, of course, I heard about Twin Flames. I looked into this idea of split aparts, right? Like there are some souls that at some point in the creation process were split apart. One was made into two and there were now two actual souls that were from the same whole and perfectly represented the other. And in twin flame mythology, if you will, this has become kind of the idea of your ultimate one, the ultimate person who's your match the ultimate person who you are meant to find in this lifetime and meant to be with no matter what. That's your twin flame. That's who you are, just in another person. And when you see and meet this twin flame, there's a resounding witnessing that takes place in the physical body, like your heart beats really strongly out of your chest. You feel this connection, this click in with this person. And we're told that it's an undeniable response to being in the presence of this split apart and this other one. Now see, I grew up writing romance. And when I say grow up, I mean, I was seven. <laughs> I had those like black and white composition books and I would write these fairy tale princess and prince stories. Like I was always such a romantic hearted person. And when I was in my teens, I continued to write and I would write a little more grown up stories, trying to put words to an idea that I had about what love was and about what the romantic impulse was. And of course, a lot of what came up in the writing that I did was connected to the life that I was living in my parents' house and, and their marriage was incredibly chaotic. And so it was interesting how over the years, my idea of romance developed, it shifted and changed, but there was always a sense in me that there was the one, that there was somebody 
out there for me. Now, when I wrote these stories, again, starting at seven with my little composition books, which I would wrap in tinfoil so they'd be really sparkly. We were poor. That's all I had was some tinfoil. I always envisioned the protagonist or the hero of my romantic stories a certain way. And this held through my entire romance writing career. In fact, I was actually published. Don't tell anybody, please. But I was actually published. I had a romance story published many years ago because I just loved writing it. And um, with the protagonist, the hero of that story, just as every single other story, was always the same. It was always like a certain height, had a certain kind of hair color, definitely had a very specific eye color. In fact, it was this aquamarine kind of crystalline, cerulean blue, just beautiful, gorgeous eyes. And I would try to write stories, because I wrote so many of them, I would try to write the next story and change the protagonist and get away from this prototype that I had written about all my life. But the farther away I got from the prototype, the more I like, it was an echo, like, no, I gotta write about that guy. I gotta write about that hero, that's the one I feel. Like I feel in my spirit. Now you can chalk that up to be me being a romantic young lady or you can chalk that up to something else. A homing beacon inside of me that was leading me to somebody. But over the years, over the decades, I dare say over the millennia, <laughs> that's how old I am, I'm joking. Over the years and over the decades, I kind of started losing hope, not unlike that one person recently who said like, is this for real? This is starting to feel like a sham, this idea of a twin flame. And it was starting to feel that way for me too because I would enter into relationships and marriages. I never met a marriage that I didn't want to be in all in. I wanna marry that guy, Lord. But I mean, after entering into so many different relationships with people who weren't the prototype, they weren't the one that I saw in my mind's eye that I wrote about when I was seven years old and 16 years old and 19 and 22. I just started to think, eh, this is just my imagination and isn't it powerful? Of course, imagination is powerful. FYI, what you think in the mind, in the imaginal mind, is a reality unto itself just because it's not here in the physical materiality yet does not mean that it's not actually happening. Indeed it is. In fact, most intuitive abilities, clairvoyance for example, happen within the mind's eye. People see it with their eyes closed or they see it in the imagination, but they're seeing accurately. They're seeing precognitively because the imagination, the imaginal realm is real. It's real. So, but I was starting to think, well, I'm just fanciful, romantic little lady came up through abuse, parents had a horrible marriage, I was writing about the love that I truly wanted to experience, and so on and so forth. And so after my second marriage, I entered into a season of my life where I just kind of forgot about it. You know what I mean? I gave up on it, kind of. And don't they always say when you stop obsessing about finding the person, that's when they come? Of course, I'd heard about that all my life. Um, and that's kind of what happened in my 40s. I just, I dated this one guy. He was crazy. Oh, that's a whole nother Oprah. I, we got to talk about that at some point because that guy was psychic. We'll talk about it some other time. Anyway, dated him for a little while. That was super chaotic, totally antithetical to the integrity of my person, but I did it for a while. And then I dated other people, super awesome people, and I just kind of bounced around. I really had never had an opportunity to date because again, I was like that cow that was always being led into the corral and, you know, branded, more married, married. I'm all, I was always married. So I had these this brief few years where I was like, oh my God, I can date around. I can see who's out there. In the back of my mind, I always had the prototype, you know, the echo of the prototype. And even though, for the most part, I'd kind of let that go, I've, I had surrendered that idea. Because truly, expectation is the root of all suffering, people. Like when we expect life to be a certain way and then it's not, it hurts. When we expect partners to be a certain way and they're not, well, we suffer. So I was really, at this point in my life, early 40s, getting into the idea like, just stop expecting stuff from people, from jobs, from the weather, from your life, from money. Like stop expecting stuff. Just be and be happy and move in the direction of the energy that accumulates. And I was training myself to do that. And the energy happened to accumulate 
you know, around and within quite a few men. And I kind of hopped around and did my thing. And one day I was on this dating app. I'm not afraid to tell you that. We live in the internet era. Of course I was on a dating app. It was free. I wasn't going to pay for that. But I was on a dating app and I was like clicking through all those men who didn't have shirts on in their bathroom or on a Harley. I didn't get it. Put on a shirt, people. Women don't want to see that. Anyway, clicking through. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I stopped on this profile. Noticed two things. First thing I noticed was this person's vocabulary. It was wonderful. You know what I'm saying? Sexy. So smart. God, I love a smart person. So smart. And one of his keywords, you know, you keep it keywords that represent you, was the word was a word that I used in my profile. And it was a word that I don't hear a lot of people saying. And I don't know why it's a common word. It's a common enough word, but it's alacrity. More people need that. <laughs> and he had it as a keyword. I had it as a keyword. But mostly he was intelligent. And what he spoke about wasn't like, yeah, I want to meet some hot babes and want to, you know, Netflix and chill, even though it was way before Netflix and chill. Wasn't that? It was, it was smart. And it was, well, it was a profile and a description written with alacrity. So that was the first thing that I, I noticed. The second thing I noticed were the eyes of this man. They were cerulean blue, Caribbean blue, if you like Enya. They were those that was, they were crystalline. He had a picture of himself like in the shaft of light. It was kind of a weird shot, but it was compelling. And it just lit up his laser blue eyes. And I was like, oh shit, like there was a, sorry for swearing. There was like a, a rumbling in my body like a, oh god those are the eyes i've seen those eyes in past life regressions i've seen those eyes as a seven-year-old girl writing in my little composition composition book i've written about those eyes in countless romantic stories those are the eyes curiously it was a picture with like just his eyes so you never know right you're online dating a lot of you have probably done that you never know what you're gonna get <laughs> life is like a box of weirdo chocolates when you're on a dating app but I was compelled. And so I think I wrote, oh, the other thing was, I was young. He was young. I was super, I was a super coug. Cougaring up and down. Cougaring all up in these streets. I was a super coug. He was like six years younger than me. I was 40, I want to say three or two. He was in his like 30s. But I was like, I don't know, his eyes. And also, I wasn't one to really ever reach out to a dude um, I would always like have a profile and then deactivate it after a day because all the messages from the cra all the crazy, crazy, crazy. And then I take like a month to go through all that, is whatever. Um, but so within that period of time where my profile was up, I saw these laser eyes, the alacrity of it all, and his youth. And I wrote him and I said, "Hey, I said something, <laughs> Brill. Of course, I'm funny." said something cute, you know, whatever. And on my profile, I had some, you know, cute little pictures. You know how we do. And he wrote back. And I said, and then I was about to deactivate my profile as I did like within 48 hours of activating it. And I said, hey, you know, if you want to friend me on Facebook, that'd be cool. Let's stay in touch. And he did. And he stayed in my Facebook for a year. And I really didn't talk to him. And then one day I noticed that he was talking with my daughter online. My, my daughter had just was like crazy about Skyrim. It was coming out and she was just like all nuts. And I bought her Skyrim and she was talking about it on my page. And he stepped in and he started talking to her. And I noticed the way that he talked to her. It wasn't like he was talking down to her, like he was talking down to a kid. Because at the time, I think she was 13 or 14. He was talking to her in a really cool way, like as an equal and very respectful, you know, on my page. I don't know. I just noticed it. I was dating that weird guy off and on. Totally have to tell you that story. If you want to hear that story, you got to tell me in the comments. <laughs> That's a story. Still dating him. And I think we're in one of our off periods. And I notice how he talks. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the guy with the laser eyes, the prototype eyes. And I started, you know, it put a little bee in my bonnet. And I started thinking about him a little bit. And as I thought about it, like, as it works, thoughts are things, you know, the awareness began to grow. And 
I interacted with him a little. I went to his page. I kind of checked him out a little more. He didn't have a lot of pictures, but what I did see, he was kind of cute. Mm, okay. And I think it was around Christmas, because I think Skyrim came out in October. Around Christmas, my daughter, sick and tired of me and all my dramalicious BS, was so over the, that weirdo, that sorry, that guy that I was dating. He's not weird. He's just himself, okay? So over it, though, my daughter, like, stamped her foot and said, Mom, why can't you just date somebody like Jeremy Compton? And I, and I thought, oh, well, that's a good question. It is a good question. And though I've never asked anybody out on a date, I've never approached anybody and said, hey, how you doing? Uh, how, it, you want to go on a date? I never did anything like that. I, like, PM'd him. Like, I slid into those DMs, you know what I'm saying? And I said, hi, my name is Crystal, and you talked to my daughter recently, and I noticed that you talked to her, how are you doing? And he talked back, and he was kind of off. <laughs> There's a reason why, but he was just kind of like super stoic, not super excited to hear from me, which shocked me. Hello. I was like, <sighs> shocking. But he was just like, how are you doing? And I wrote back, and I'm like, I'm doing well, thank you. What do you, you know, and I'm just trying to have a conversation. I want to say I did this for about four weeks and you'd have to know me back then, like all single. God, I was so cute, like out in, out in the clubs and bars and just having fun. And like, I didn't chase guys, but I was like, there's something about this one. And so I would slide back into those DMs. One night, late one night, while on a cocktail of Lunesta, and Pinot Noir, because <laughs> I've had insomnia since 2008. But I'm like, I had a glass of wine, and I went to bed. I had took my Luna. No, it was an Ambien. Oh, oh, Ambien make, makes us crazy. Makes me do things that I don't remember that I do anyway. So on Ambien and like a Pinot Noir, I got up into those DMs and I just started being super overt. I'm like, well, I'm not going to write you anymore because every time I write you, you're really stoic. Like you don't want to talk to me. And if you don't want to talk to me, that's perfectly fine. So I'm going to stop. I'm just letting you know I'm stopping right now. I'm not going to write you anymore. It's so dumb. So middle school. And he wrote, he wrote back, but I, <laughs> so I wake up in the morning and anybody who's ever been on Ambien, you know what I mean? I used to blog on Ambien, these crazy freaking blogs. I'd wake up in the morning mortified. Oh my God. I said all that weird stuff and I'd take it down. Like that was a constant thing that happened with or without the Pinot Noir. Woke up in the morning, started getting things in order and, and had this sudden lightning bolt of remembrance of the DM I sent to him. Like, oh my God, ran into my computer, type brought up Facebook, got into Messenger, hoping that, well, I don't even think you can delete, just hoping beyond hope that I read reading what I said and it was really overt and he had responded actually I saw that he responded I'm whispering because I'm so mortified for myself I'm cringing on the inside of my being I saw that he responded and I wouldn't read it I'm like I can't read I can't read it my daughter who was there said let me read it I'm like no I just don't read it I don't want to know I'm sure he's telling me to f off I'm a, I'm just crazy she's like no let me read it so she took the laptop and she read it and she's like he wants to take you on a date. I'm like, oh, really? Okay. So like a week later, I go on a date with Jeremy Compton and I've kind of forgotten in my mind about his eyeballs in that picture because it was like a year before in some dating app and I didn't remember a whole lot. And I walked into this dive bar where I suggested we might like to meet and across the room, I see this guy of a certain height and build. He's just a big old boy, you know what I'm saying? Oh my God, he's so handsome. Big broad shoulders, kind of going down into a V, 6'3", dark hair, like that guy I used to write about. And he was faced in a different direction. And I walked in with this weird kitty cat hat. And he saw me and I saw him and then I saw those eyes. And it was like something just clicked inside of me. You know how, I don't know, like a foundation of something just clicked inside of me. It was like such an 
aha moment like oh wow when i was seven and writing those stories i was writing those stories about this guy this is exactly who i would envision when i would write all of my stories and when i would try to veer away from the prototype and write about some blonde guy or some a surfer or some, i would always come back to this six three dark hair caribbean blue eyes this build this way of being and i knew in that moment oh my god there is a one, capital O. It's real. Our second date that we went out, and he was so cute. Oh my God, he dressed up like he was going to a job interview, which he was, which he was. He's going to get the job or he wasn't. <laughs> I got a job for you, hon. Anyway, so on the second date, we went to a different dive bar and we were playing pool and we were sitting down and I heard, like you're hearing me talk to you with my mouth ball. I heard as loud as day my own voice saying, I just love you so much, Jeremy. It was so loud that I startled in the stool and I looked at him like, did I just say that with my mouth? Did I say that? I didn't say it. I heard it clear audiently. I precognitively pulled from the timeline something that I was going to say to him within a few months time. And it was so loud and resounding that I hopped up off that bar stool and said, I got to go. And I went to the bathroom and I just stood there kind of going like this because it was so evidential. And um, sure enough, I ended up saying, I love you so much, Jeremy. Well, within probably three months time and the rest is history. We're married He's wonderful. He's nothing like me in terms of being woo woo or being psychic or being into frequency and vibration. He's a scientist. He's worked on artificial intelligence. He's very left brained, but he's perfect for me. He's perfect for me. He went with me to the retreat that I put on this year called the Bliss Retreat in Loveland, Colorado. And I swear to God, everybody loved him more than they loved me. They he given out hugs. His hugs are so great. He's such a big, just everybody loved him and he's just perfect for me. So what does that all mean, Crystal, in terms of twin flames? You said you were going to talk about that, that my mind has changed with regard to the lore and mythology and idea of twin flames. Do I believe in twin flames? No. No, I don't. Do I believe in the one within a lifetime? Yes, I do. Do I believe in soulmates? Absolutely. Absolutely. Soulmates, however, aren't people necessarily that we're romantically engaged with. Soulmates can be your children. My daughter is most definitely one of my soulmates, one of my closest soulmates, one of my best friends, definitely a soulmate. But there is kind of a hierarchy of soul matches that we have. See, before we ever come into this world, in this incarnation, we assemble with kind of a team, a council, if you will, of our guides, our emissaries, our higher self, all the energy, all the divine celestial content, knowledge, information. And we also assemble with our soul group. Each and every one of us has a group of souls with which we are very closely related. And we tend to incarnate with them life after life after life. But there are levels with soul groups. And what I mean by this is some souls in our soul group we incarnate with maybe every other life or every five lives we always recognize them on an energetic level you know when you see somebody from across the room you don't know who they are but you just feel like whoa so connected to them they're probably in your soul group and then there are those levels that are more intimate and more close and these are the souls that tend to show up in our lives in romantic relationships because Romantic relationships are relationships in which the energy of love is expressed in a higher, more complete way. Not always. Sometimes that love can get bastardized and can become really toxic, but it's possible in romantic love relationships to really tap into like the energy of the universe, of source, of all magical things. That man, when it's good, it's really, really good. Now, but those intimate people in your soul group can also be, again, your children or your parents. 100%. My dearly departed mom is a very intimate member of my soul group. My brother, 
who I love with all my heart is absolutely very intimate and my soul group. And these are the people, and my daughter too, and Jeremy. These are the people with whom I incarnate life after life after life after life. And if next time we have an opportunity to incarnate, first of all, I am piecing out of that. I don't want, I, give me a break a little bit. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to come back to earth right away. It's just too much. So, but maybe Jeremy will. Maybe Jeremy's like, well, wait, we're moving towards transhumanism and look at all this cool AI technology. I want to be in an incarnation. That happens. Sometimes people in the intimate level of the soul group will incarnate while others say, I just need one life to just sit this one out. But that person who sits it out of the incarnation always acts, typically, usually asks, acts as an emissary as a spirit guide, or as a friend in spirit, a resource, if you will, that the person who incarnates always kind of feels, always sort of senses, and is always there just to kind of give those etheric hugs. Now, is Jeremy my twin flame? I don't think so, because I don't think I believe in twin flames anymore. I don't think we need to, people. I really don't think we need to have such high standards for other folks. I think we should sort of stop expecting the perfect person. And although, even though the story I just described kind of sets it up to indicate there is one perfect person, I don't think that means we're twin flames. I just mean, I, I just think that in this life, in terms of agreements and contracts and that blueprint that we brought in, we agreed we are gonna be so special to one another. We are gonna be in this love relationship where we can express at such a higher level the energy of love, which is of course source, God is love. And like you and I, we're gonna do that together. We're gonna to bring that out of each other. And so in this life, he is my most prominent soul connection, soul lover, the lover of my soul. I can't imagine entering into another life where he wouldn't be thus, and so perhaps in every life he plays this role. Does that make him a twin point? I don't know. I don't know. Problem with the new age communities, we're getting all crazy. There's so much, so much dumb stuff. I mean, some of the, some of the ideas, some of the channeled information, it's just so out of, out of it. It's just, it's not like feel for yourself okay so for those of you who are saying to yourself this just doesn't feel right like i'm not finding this person i don't sense this person i don't know where this person let yourself off the hook you don't have to believe in some new age idea concept or theology dogma in order to be happy right where you are now and take take a lesson from me it wasn't until i got out of this second marriage that i was in more branded in the corral for 15 years y'all as a married person, it wasn't until I was out of there and experiencing my life and working on me, truly, getting into the stuff, do you know what I mean? The psychology, the patterns, the abuses, the stuff I had lived through, fixing it, bringing the alignment and bringing truly the light into it. It wasn't until I was doing that plus going out, doing a little dancing, you know, having a cocktail with my friends, just being happy, being whatever age I was, being in whatever condition I was, meeting people, just flowing, not needing it to be anything, not needing a dude, like I was fine, I was fine. It wasn't, it truly wasn't until then that the capital O one with those laser eyes walked right into my life in his business interview clothing. Now, six years later, so happily married. If it can happen to me, after all my trial and error, one million marriages, relationships, then I know it can happen for you as well. So that's my thought about that. Bye, guys.